Good afternoon, and welcome to a webinar on analytical methods of fruit fraud detection hosted by EAS Consulting Group and presented by EAS Independent Consultant, Dr. Merdad Tashkrini. EAS, a member of the Certified Family of Companies, is a leader in regulatory solutions for industries regulated by FDA. Our global network of over 150 independent advisors and consultants enables EAS to provide comprehensive consulting, training, and auditing services, ensuring proactive regulatory compliance. From regulatory strategy development, compliance assistance, preparation of technical submissions such as RAS and NDIs, FISMA assessments, including supply chains, quality agreements, support for receipt, support for receipt of Form 483s and warning letter remediation, EAS offers the detailed knowledge and experience your company requires to ensure accurate and timely assistance. Today's presenter is EAS independent consultant, Dr. Merdad Tashkrimi. He is an expert in national and international food safety regulations, warehouse and wholesale manufacturing, HACCP, food defense, and BRC. He assists clients with Food Safety Modernization Act compliance, as well as natural food preservatives and packaging, foodborne pathogenic and spoilage microorganisms, shelf life studies, and more. As a reminder, during the webinar, you may ask any questions by typing them into the questions box. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Merdash Ashkrimi. And Murdad, you should have control over the screen now. Oh, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, 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 hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much, Amy, for your great introduction. I'm uh, glad to present uh, about the method detections for food fraud, and we will have our discussion begin now. Uh, let me see if I can go to the next slide in here. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as uh, um, as probably um, uh, some of the followers might notice, this is the second uh, food fraud uh, webinar that we are presenting uh, following the. Uh, uh, the first food fraud initiation puzzle uh, that we had uh, a couple months ago. Uh, this, this time we are going to go a little bit deeper into the technology and a little bit details about uh, availability of detection methods. Uh, as, uh, as you noticed, uh, I'm a member of AOAC food fraud uh, uh, detection committee for non-targeted food and we are working on developing uh, standard methods for food fraud detection. And we are trying to make sure that we have the updated methods. So this is part of that effort. So I think it would be good to share those information with a little bit uh, extra information about uh, different technologies in this presentation. So uh, in, this, in this lecture, we were going to cover the three different uh, uh, categories is the food category based uh, detection methods and the test and technology category for detection methods and a little bit brief, uh, a little bit details of each technology uh, because uh, there are lots of different aspects of technologies and uh, we, we probably can just mention the names and a little bit of uh, connections between the technique and the food category. Uh, and uh, the rest definitely would be available if, if there is a need for uh, providing certain services for laboratories or uh, uh, investors that wants to step in into the food fraud detection uh, methods and detection uh, services. Uh, I've been involved in lots of these type of projects, so I would be glad to assist in case if it needed. So, uh, yeah, so we have in, in that food category, what we are going to cover is mainly going to be meat, dairy, honey, and olive oil. Uh, we have, the, I just select these four, four categories because uh, I, I thought it might have uh, a lot of discussion in different uh, 
um, groups about uh, food fraud in these categories. So probably would be good to have these four examples, getting a little bit deeper into the concepts of food fraud detection in these four categories and have a little bit of uh, discussion in this. And uh, so in the food detection methods, what we are going to cover are going to be uh, uh, three main categories. Uh, one is the DNA-based technology methods that are uh, considered uh, PCR or polymerase chain reaction, qPCR or quantitative polymerase chain reaction, and NGS or next generation sequencing technologies uh, that uh, are available and currently being used for uh, detecting food fraud. And we will talk, talk about lots of advances in spectroscopic methods, uh, um, especially in the last 10 years. And there are lots of in interesting methods in that approach. Infrared technology, um, NIR, MIR, and FDIR methods, uh, ultraviolet method, RS and IS methods. And uh, they are the second, the third category is going to be chromatic graphic methods that HPLC, GC, and INC are going to be uh, discussed a little bit. As I mentioned, uh, we are not going to get deep into any of these sections. We, we get, have an overview about it. Uh, because there are very details, there are lots of specifications, there are lots of technical details and categories for each of these methods that needs to be uh, adjusted based on the food category, based on the detection limits, based on the limit of uh, uh, quantification, limit of qualification, and they, they, those can be adjusted if uh, a laboratory uh, decide to use any of these methods in in their lab. So uh, we are, uh, the, the rest, uh, this is another section. We also have uh, uh, other methods that we, we have a little bit of uh, discussion on that. So NMR is another method that uh, it has been uh, used for uh, detecting. Uh, in here, we have started giving examples between the food category and the method. For example, we can detect high fructose corn syrup in honey using NMR or SERS method that we can detect soybean oil in olive oil if it's been added, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. ELISA method, which is uh, immunosorbent assay method, we can, we can detect fish mislabeling issues. And uh, the sensory method, voltammetric electronic tongue, also can uh, also be used for detecting, for example, barley and malt extract in flora and honey. As you can see, uh, for, um, so when we are discussing about detection methods, it needs to be clean, clarified which food category we want to use and work and, and how we, what is the desired level of detection we wish to do and depends on the food category, how much interest is in this method's usage. These methods, some of them are very expensive. Uh, they need to have a lot of uh, investment, initial investment, for example, NMR methods. Uh, there are lots of uh, uh, initial expense to develop the, and establish the lab for that. Uh, and But it, it may be uh, economical for establishing that those types of laboratory in case that we, uh, we need to define a certain food fraud from, let's say, certain country that imports or exports food or uh, honey, for example, would be a good example. And uh, ELISA method is probably a cheaper method to establish, but we need to know whether how much we, what is the level of interest about using any of these scope of uh, food detections. So. Uh, Getting to the DNA-based technology method, the first section that uh, we just uh, introduced. So the DNA-based technology method has, uh, um, it is simplified in three main steps that we are trying to, in order for us to detect a specific food, 
we need to extract DNA from that specific food. And uh, using those steps that has been simplified in the, at the bottom, you can start understanding uh, details of the DNA that has been extracted and uh, understand how that in DNA could be related to the food category that we are uh, working to detect the food fraud. So um, I think uh, I, I'm very positive on applications of next generation sequencing in uh, food fraud detection, uh, especially if we can get the DNA uh, successfully out of the food. Uh, just give an example, for example, uh, uh, we have, uh, there are efforts to detect DNA from product, dairy product like cheese, so it might be uh, successful or it might not. All depends on how successful we can uh, um, uh, we can detect the um, uh, DNA or extract DNA from uh, uh, from the food. So uh, that is going to be a very important part of uh, successfully understand or characterize the specific. Uh, cheese category for that. So uh, this, this is again, uh, we are talking about pros of DNA-based technology methods. Uh, the important part of the DNA-based uh, technology method the su for success, as I mentioned, is how we can extract the DNA successfully because when we are dealing with processed food, uh, the processing might interact with the DNA of the food material or the materials in the food and the amount of damage that the processing can impact the DNA is very important on deciding whether we can use the DNA-based technology or not. I would say it's, if, if we can detect the DNA, uh, these are very good advantages of uh, simple DNA-based technologies uh, like PCR or qPCR, and then if we can have a little bit, if we need to have more details of DNA-based technology, we can use the NGS method as well. So yeah, as uh, as we uh, we mentioned, uh, we need to uh, we need to be uh, uh, be very careful about using DNA-based technologies because. Some of them are highly, highly sensitive, and uh, we have tremendous reports in both medical field and food field that uh, certain um, detections coming from environmental contaminants, for example, we are trying to target a specific food category that we are testing, but suddenly, based on the very high susceptibility of these methods, they can detect any DNA available. So and they might give us a uh, false uh, report, uh, false negative or positive reports depending on the, the detection category and it de de depends on the method that we are using. So uh, overall, what I can say about DNA-based technology, it's promising, it can be used very successfully, efficient, but we need to be uh, in a very detailed technical uh, description of what we are going to do needs to be defined, SOPs needs to be completely clear about using the DNA-based technology. And, uh, but overall, I think if we can define it, if we can invest properly on this process, then we can step in and use these methods that are uh, I would say it's much more economical compared to some other methods that we are going to discuss today. Yeah, and this is the example of how we can use the DNA-based technology methods in different food categories. Yeah, and then um, these are some applications of DNA-based technology. We can use that uh, in uh, GMOs, um, uh, genetically modified organisms. We can uh, certify gelatin capsules uh, uh, if it's originated from pork or other animals, uh, especially for halal, halal certified companies. We can, uh, this is an example, another example, Greek feta cheese. Uh, is it originated from cow milk or sheep milk? Uh, as I said, uh, uh, 
uh, we can use these methods very efficiently, very successfully, if we can extract the DNA uh, uh, efficiently. But this is very helpful because the price of cow milk and sheep milk in, is going to be much different for developing feta cheese. So, and these are other examples of DNA-based uh, tests. As you can see, uh, we can use the DNA-based tests for horse meat, for, under, for detecting uh, the true blue crab, red snapper, and uh, we can use it for uh, catfish, pork and beef, and uh, chinook and coho and socket salmon we can use that. This is another um, application, again, the, the more simplified uh, DNA-based technology that we can use. Uh, uh, when we are using real-time PCR quantitative, the quality, um, what are the materials exist in the product in very, very sensitive mode, meaning that we can go in, in some qPCR laboratories, they can detect uh, a very low number of DNA exists in the food material. And that's what I'm in emphasizing of making sure that we are not testing the environment of the lab. Even inside the biosafety cabinet, it needs to be extremely, extremely clean before we start doing tests. But by using these tests, we can make sure that uh, exactly what exists or what not exists in the food. Uh, although the quantitative approach is not available through these methods. So we cannot say how much of certain things are exist in a mix of food, but we can definitely say that what are or what are not, what is or what is not in that food. Yeah, so uh, we are getting step into uh, uh, the second section of food detection um, methods, which are spectroscopic methods, which uh, in this case, uh, we are just giving, uh, this is schematics of how we can use methods like Raman spectroscopy and FTIR methods for detecting, uh, differentiating between olive oil and adulterate or not oil. So um, this, is, uh, this table is very, very simplified version of PCA or principal component analysis of how if we have different type of food, uh, different type of oils, how different oils will react to the uh, uh, excitement that caused by uh, uh, different type of infrared that will result in the reflections that we can record and put them in a statistical, organization uh, like this, and then we can detect if it is adulterated or original uh, olive oil or not oil. So this is an example of uh, using these methods. We will go a little bit deep on uh, the concept of Ramon and FTIR later. So uh, this is an, so we, we, and as you can see, we can detect soybean oil in olive oil. Uh, these are examples that are published in the peer-reviewed journals. Uh, so if we can use medium infrared and Raman spectroscopy method for differentiating between soybean oil and olive, in olive oil, if it is. And uh, I, I understand this is very important uh, food adulteration in olive oil, and it's going to change the price of the production dramatically but we can have methods to detect these type of uh, fraud if we use a proper method. Again, these methods are applicable based on the level of interest and detection and uh, the amount of food fraud uh, uh, in the specific category of food that we are testing. Yeah, this is another example, sunflower oil in olive oil. Uh, we are using, we can use DSC method and also we can use synchronous fluorescent spectroscopy. And uh, these are again, um, different type of uh, spectroscopic methods that can be used. They mainly what they are doing is they are emitting a different source of light to the food category, different food category and the reflections or the response 
response from excitement is recorded by a receptor in the other side, and those receptors give the data to a computer that they can categorize those food categories from each other. I will talk a little bit more in, in future slides about the importance of knowing the authentic food, meaning that when we are saying it's, we are trying to detect sunflower oil in olive oil, we need to make sure that we know exactly what olive oil is in using those methods. So uh, they are, for example, in this specific example, what I learned from experts in this field is, so we can have olive oil. Uh, we need to make sure that that olive oil that we are testing uh, for specific ge geographical region, they have their own characterization. We need to make sure that we, first we have an authentic olive oil tested and recorded, and then, then use that authentic graph and uh, recorded data to compare and contrast with any adulteration. So that's also very important for detecting food fraud food authenticity test before we step in and say this is a fraud or not. Yeah, this is another thing. Uh, I'm, when, uh, when I was trying to make this slide, it was funny. I said, uh, these are really interesting that how they can add these type of things in the olive oil to make it looks like olive oil and sell us to, sell to people. So yeah, this is again Raman spectroscopy combined with interval partial least square and synergy interval. Uh, again, uh, this method is going to be a specific excitement um, uh, that we can um, uh, test the different olive oil and we can uh, uh, the compare and contrast with the authentic food. Yeah, this is again, uh, we, we are still in olive oil, we'll step into the honey later, but this is another example of any type of other vegetables that can add to olive oil. We can use UVIMS fluorescence and, uh, and uh, again, FTIR mixture of FTIR, UV, and IR spectroscopy. IR is infrared, FTIR is Fourier transfer infrared, UV is ultraviolet spectroscopy. So. When we are dealing with uh, overall, when we are dealing with a category name other vegetable oil, we are talking we are talking about lots of different emission results from the excitement that we are giving. So in order for us to be able to differentiate other vegetable oils from the real olive oil that we already authenticized it before, we need to use the variety of different receivers or detectors to give us the category of what we are trying to figure out. So this is very important for everyone to understand that the more, the more broad we go for detecting food fraud, the more we need to have different sensors and detectors and excitement methods. So in this example, we are using infrared, we are using ultraviolet, to excite and uh, make a response from the food category and then record with the, their own relevant sensor. IR sensors are different than UV sensors and then combine all together to get a conclusion about, okay, so these are other vegetables oil available in all, all olive oil. And uh, the, the, this is important also for everyone to notice that when we are talking about detection, method the same for other food category we need to plan for it we need to know what we are looking for and how much detail we want to go and how broad we want to test if we want to say okay i want to test every fraud in honey just right in one glance then we need to have a variety of different excitement methods and variety of different detection methods to do that but if we just want to say no i just wanted to know a specific type of uh food fraud in honey or in uh, pollen, pollen or different category, we need to be specifically looking for that category. So uh, although the technologies are very good, they are very detailed and uh, it's not just having an instrument set for detecting the method. We need to have, we need, we need, there, there are lots of planning for it. There are lots of SOPs designed for specific method that can be used for 
food fraud detection. So, yeah, so we get to the milk now. Uh, again, uh, this is an example that probably uh, 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 most people remember about the melamine issue that uh, it, it has been uh, recognized in milk. Unfortunately, there was lots of uh, there are lots of issues um, with adding melamine in milk, and uh, these are methods that has been established. Uh, again, if you look at the methods, they are again spectroscopic methods. They are exciting the milk, and they are re receiving response from uh, uh, different part of milk. And here, whey milk, or uh, uh, for example, urea, or uh, di dyson diamide in milk. So uh, you can see that we are having lots of different methods that are exciting the original food, which is the clean and nice milk, and then compare and contrast with the excitement of uh, adulterated one and record and compare and contrast based on the computer uh, recording or the statistical pattern that we get. Generally speaking, principal component analysis is a very important part of getting understanding the differences between responses from different excitement on the methods. Yeah, this is also another example. We can, uh, you can see there are two different methods. It's just in here, that's a very good example of, uh, we are talking about a certain food fraud, hydrogen peroxide in milk, but we are using two different methods. One is the chrom chrom uh, a chrom chromatographic method, one is a spectroscopic method. So meaning that we can use these two methods. Uh, we need to know uh, how much we need to use either of those and uh, what is the desired level of detection for detecting any of those two. So uh, how deep we wish to have this method and how frequent we wish to use this method because for example, HPLC method is a great method generally used as a reference method in lots of uh, tests. Uh, however, we need to know that HPLC methods is a little bit con time consuming. It's very detailed technical. We need to know, for example, how much uh, we need to get. What is the frequency of the test that we wish to have? How many client we will have that they are sending hydrogen peroxide samples for our laboratory. So these needs to be considered before we even decide about which methods we wish to use in our laboratory. So even if it is a university-based laboratory or a commercial laboratory, there are important parameters to have an instrument in the lab and decide about which one they want to use. And also, another important parameter in here is how stabilized the lab from the management perspective is. So when I would say when, when we are talking about detecting food fraud, uh, the certification and validation methods like uh, ISO 17025 would be ideal to have in the lab because we need to make sure that we have all the management controlled methods that needs to be established in the lab before we step in. So yeah, this is another example of we can uh, detect soy protein in milk. These, uh, and again, it's uh, uh, two different methods, chromatographic with the spectroscopic method. So we can use both uh, if we can use individual, but we need to know exactly how much deep we want to have and uh, what is the frequency of the detection methods that we are going to use. Uh, uh, talking about frequency and how deep is going to be repeated in practically all the slides, I probably omit to talking about that because I just want to emphasize that when we are designing a procedure or a method in our lab, we need to think much, much ahead of time that why we are doing this and how much we need to go through this because definitely these methods need a trained individual to take care individuals to take care of it and needs to be consistent because we are dealing with food fraud and there are lots of legal perspective behind it if we uh, and then having a certified lab is i think also important because when we are dealing with the court issues when we say hey this milk has soy protein this milk imported from country x to country y and then there's going to be a legal battle and then everything goes to much much details in the laboratories that are deciding to do this so i would say 
it's very important for every laboratory to have a clear SOPs and clear plan before they start uh, uh, giving service uh, for these type of food fraud categories. Now we are getting to the honey. Uh, yeah, so as you can see, uh, we get to a little bit again to a spectroscopic method. Uh, the reason we are changing from uh, chromatographic methods uh, in milk to spectroscopic methods in honey, I think it's uh, probably it's interesting. Uh, so we are using, so honey is a little bit clear uh, and the light can pass through it a little bit easier. Therefore, uh, the spect spectroscopic methods step in a little bit more compared to uh, chromatographic methods. Although we can we still can use chromatographic methods, but as I mentioned, the chromatographic methods are a little bit uh, different from the expenses and price-wise. So we need to be careful about uh, why we are using the specific methods uh, or not. Yeah, so this is another example. Corn syrup in Acadia honey. Again, um, these are all PGVU uh, articles that uh, I've been used. So we can use these type of different methods to detect corn syrup in honey. So I, this is the first time I'm putting electric nose and electronic tongue. So these are kind of electric sensors. So they are not chromatographic or uh, um, spectroscopic, they are kind of um, um, electronic version of uh, an understanding or finding certain uh, certain impedance of electricity passing through uh, material and then they can detect. Again, NIR and media are again a spectroscopic method that can be used for these type of wood detections. Yeah, this is another example, barley malt syrup in, in heater honey. So this is another uh, project that has been published that they use automatic pulse voltmetric electronic tongue to differentiate between the, the barley malt syrup in heater honey. If we go through this article, for example, we will see that they have their own de determination of what level of detection they are uh, claiming that they can do. So if we plan to find uh, a, a 99%, uh, we plan to find 1% food fraud in 99% food, it's much different method compared to if you wanna detect 99.9% .9 of uh, clear food in 0.1% food fraud. So the, the, the spe then it's stepping to the specificity and sensitivity of the detection methods that getting to again to the detection method categories. And then uh, when we are talking, when we want to specify more, then we need to use the methods that are more, uh, uh, they are more detailed and, and specific compared to more sensitive and screening methods. For example, screening methods can be done probably easier in, um, in a small lab or in a plant lab or in a, you know, uh, you know, certain small size testing laboratories. But when we are getting to specificity, then we are going to need to have a little bit more detailed uh, procedures, more detailed instrumentation, and we can go for that. I would say generally, as a general advice, I would say, let's step in when we are deciding to decide to find a specific food fraud, let's step in for that we can screen successfully and see if we can screen uh, correctly, meaning that how much false positive and false negative we have, then we can verify it in our SOP with the specific methods that can be done in a more detailed lab to see if our screening method is successful. So what I'm, overall, the, the purpose of this uh, detail that I mentioned is, uh, th there always needs to be plan before and the plan during the laboratory establishment and uh, after laboratory establishment. This is another example. So they use a voltmetric electronic tongue for finding barely malt syrup in orange blossom. So this is also another interesting example. And so this is another interesting one. For, uh, we get again to uh, chromatography and uh, 
a spectroscopy method. So it's just high fructose corn sugar in floral honey that they can use both in order to, um, to detect. So these are different methods that has been used and they can be used based on, again, why, how, how sensitive or how specific we wish to have the detection method to go through. Yeah, uh, so invert cane sugar in orange blossom, again, FTIR has been used in uh, an article that uh, they have used this method successfully and uh, an example of this has been here. Yeah, so we just get through a specific method, uh, a spectroscopic method now, since we talked a lot about it, I think it's good to get an overview about what type of food has been uh, recorded that has been using spectroscopic methods. So for infrared method, again, this is infrared is type of wavelengths that can be exciting, excite the food category and the response from electron excitements can be recorded by a sensor. So you see NIR or near infrared has been used for vegetable oils such as corn seed oils and olive oil in extra virgin olive oil. MIR or mid infrared has been used in to detect hazelnut node in extra virgin olive oil. FTIR uh, has been used for extra uh, reference method for extra virgin olive oil, melamine detection in food, in milk, sugar added to milk, rice syrup and invert beet sugar in honey or invert cane sugar in honey. UV methods has been used for um, different type of synthetic material added to honey and uh, for detecting soybean and corn and other seed oils into the vegetable oil. And we also can use it to detect formaldehyde or formalin in milk. Raman spectroscopy, again, we can use it as a reference method for extra virgin olive oil and beet sugar syrup to, and high fructose corn sugar in honey. And IS, we can use that or impedance spectroscopy. We can use it for detect formaldehyde or formalin in milk. Yeah, so this is a, now we are getting a little bit de deeper to the technique or methodology, just, just to have a little overview about what we are talking about, sensors and excitement. So in here, we just have a brief uh, schematic of what type of uh, light or wavelengths we are talking about. So as you can see, we are, when we are talking about infrared, it's similar to uh, the heating in our, in our home, uh, the electric heater. So we are making a specific type of wavelengths that needs to pass through side. So as you can see, ultraviolet, and visible light are ultraviolet is around 400 nanometer and above. Visible light is around between 400 to 800. And near infrared goes a little bit higher wavelengths. And uh, mid infrared and far infrared is practically the heat. So it's high, very high wavelengths and it's going to be different. But what the reason I'm putting this is just give a perspective of uh, methods that we are using for food detection, meaning that when we are exciting food, we are exciting electrons in the food category and we measuring the amount of response from electrons from that food to uh, and record it computer based to compare and contrast. So again, this is the similar example of what we discussed originally in the first couple of slides. So this is just a little bit detailed. You're seeing that we have the responses we got when we excite extra virgin olive oil is going to be all in the same area of our principal component analysis by computer system or statistically. And that's a very different response from excitement compared to canola oil and it's different from corn oil. This is schematic, it's not like very accurate. I just wanted to give an insight about what, how we can really differentiate that. Now, when we are trying to differentiate extra virgin olive oil from canola oil, we need to make sure that we know exactly what extra virgin olive oil is. We have authenticity for that and we know exactly what canola oil is. We all have authentic canola oil and we need to have authentic corn oil. When we mix these together, we can differentiate them when we have the infrared test result 
based on referencing to our, our authenticity test. Yeah, so uh, youth ultraviolet is using low frequency, as you could, as you remember in previous slide, we used the uh, frequency above 400 nanometer that are going to be absorbed by the food, and then the response from that absorption is going to be collected by a by a by a detection detector that is going to be ultraviolet detector. Raman spectroscopy is uh, we are practically using a specific type of wavelengths and a specific type of um, uh, photons to get through the food and get the response from the excitement of the food when we are uh, receiving the response. This is a very general schematics of uh, how the food categories are, uh, when we exciting the specific food category, how it's going to give us the response when we are giving energy to different food, when the energy received by the food, it's going to absorb in their electron. And then after we remove the energy source, they are going to return back that energy. And if we have a good detector, we can detect that response. And those response are specific to the specific food category. And this is the main advantage in the last uh, decade probably in the last two decades of using these methods efficiently in food categories. Yeah, impedance spectroscopy is, is a little bit different. We are adding, we are using electricity and measuring the difference of the response from the resistant from the we get. And that's also, again, we giving electricity. We are having sensors to detect the response of our resistance from the electricity, and we can measure that. As you you probably can assume these methods are a little bit cheaper compared to uh, other methods, but we need to know uh, what type of food fraud we are testing and what type of result we are expecting. Yeah, these are also, again, example of different uh, type of met uh, chromatographic methods uh, that has been used uh, for, uh, for detecting food fraud. Uh, this is the HPLC method. We, we can use a variety of uh, adulteration that has been in uh, um, honey. We can use it with HPLC method as well. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, when we are using when we are dealing with chromatography method, we are dealing with a little bit lengthier procedures because it needs to be, it's a, it's a little bit time consuming. Um, but the results are generally much, generally very accurate, very good if we have a proper SOP in place. And the GC methods, again, we can use it for detecting certain adulteration in extra virgin olive oil. Yeah, high performance liquid chromatography, another, spect uh, another uh, chromatographic method that it's in here, we can use it uh, to, uh, uh, to detect uh, uh, different uh, uh, food fraud and it the concept is we are passing uh, the food uh, the tested material through a liquid column that is going to be uh, initiate a different uh, sedimentation in, in the column and then based on the previous authentic samples we can compare and contrast and verify our food category. GC method is that now the column is going to be gas and it's going to pass through a gas system in order for us to give the same sedimentations of the different sections of the food and then we can compare and contrast with, uh, 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 with uh, food. Okay, so uh, by this, I, I just uh, finished my uh, presentation. I'm Great. ready. For Thank questions. you, Murdad. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. We uh, all appreciate that. And we do have a number of questions. So let's get right to it. Um, let's see, I've got one here. Will we get the slides? And yes, I sent the slides about 45 minutes or so before the webinar. So you should have them in your inbox. Uh, if you don't, please do email me and I can resend them to you. Uh, next question is, uh, does FDA or USDA do any routine testing for food fraud? Uh, 
Well, uh, that is a question that we can ask them uh, because as, as I mentioned, they are uh, different reasons for the food fraud detection. Uh, I'm, I know uh, for certain that they are testing residues of certain contaminants in a specific base uh, uh, annually, but I'm not sure if uh, they have a food fraud section. Probably uh, we can, uh, I can check and let, no, that's a very good point. <laughs> Okay, great. And uh, can we have some consultants who do work in seafood? So I will see if I can get more information on that area as well. Uh, let's see. Number, next question. Are there any advances in detecting DNA in dried plants? We hear from labs that simple drying and grinding of plants into powders will denature or damage the DNA beyond detection. Well, if, uh, so, well, here is the important point. If you're hearing that from a lab that is doing this uh, uh, for a while, uh, if they cannot find the DNA in their food, uh, in their samples, uh, they probably can't do it because nobody, uh, everyone wants to be paid for, for running the process. But I need to know uh, what type of extraction method generally being used. Uh, uh, there are lots of different extraction methods right now and they are uh, we sometimes they are creative ways of taking uh, dna out of the food category it depends on what method the lab used and how how much effort they put for to see any possible option to extract dna the dna extraction is the major part and the most important challenge of the DNA based technologies, as I mentioned. So it needs to be, uh, I would say, probably 70% of the effort is the DNA extraction. The rest is uh, probably much easier to follow up. Okay, thank you. And next question What are methods used to, to, use to detect food fraud and juices? Uh, well, um, so it again so it's very general questions so again similar to the slide that i have for example if we want to detect any possible contamination in honey so that when we talk about a very generalized term it needs to be very generalized sets of methods that needs to be used and uh, needs to be detected so in this specific question we need to know what type of uh, uh, juice we are talking about and what type of adulteration we need to look at it in that juice and how much is the possibility of adulteration in that addition these three things are very important uh, to detect that this is also important to mention that when also we are talking about cannabis industries that are now it's uh, everywhere when we are talking about detecting fraud in cannabis we need to make sure that uh, what, how much we need to go to details to that, how, uh, what is the sensitivity and the specificity of the category that we are talking about. Uh, so this is very ongoing process. If, if this question comes to me in a meeting with a group of lab experts, I need to know these answers before even I start responding. So we need to know a little bit more details on that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another question, can you talk about pollen tests in honey? What scientific methods would you use? Uh, so pollen is, so the, the pollen is a little bit uh, challenging. Uh, we, uh, I haven't been, uh, so that's actually a very interesting question because I was looking for an example for it. Uh, because we are dealing with a very specific uh, type of uh, product, the authenticity of that, I think, is a major challenge. Uh, if you remember, when we are talking about different type of honey categories, we need to, first, we need to make sure that we, uh, we have an authentic uh, verification of different type, the type of honey that we are looking, and then we start looking for the uh, fraud for it. For the pollen, uh, uh, I, probably I can I can look at it and if if there is an interest 
they, we can use different methods, but we need to know uh, how much deep we need to go to do this. So meaning that if we wish to use uh, spectroscopic methods, probably would be ideal if we can make a solution with the pollen and test it. Or if we wish to use the chromatographic methods, uh, uh, probably we need to dissolve it in proper solvent. And I would say probably if we can use DNA-based method also would be interesting and ideal for this. This is just my thoughts, but uh, uh, there are lots of ongoing projects on the pollen detection, but uh, I, I, don't, I haven't had it in my slides and don't have it in my mind to tell right away. <laughs> Why is uh, UV still used to quantify when results are generally inflated? Uh, so this is also a very general question. What, uh, so what type of UV test uh, it's been indicated and for what type of food category and uh, what is the inflation meaning? Inflation meaning that the results are false positive or false negative. Uh, this question needs to be a little bit more details because we are, when we are okay. talking about laboratory methods, we need to have a little bit more details of the questions. Yes, yes. So, so he did include uh, separately simple dried and ground plants or extraction with water or methanol, or, mm -hmm. or excuse me, ethanol. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's all, that's all he sent in. Okay, well, um, I need to know a little bit more detail because, uh, so they are using ethanol and methanol for a plant-based uh, category. Is that what, what it says? Uh, just a simple dried and ground plant or extraction with water or ethanol. Right, and then um, hey, is David, there a if you'll, if you'll yeah. provide a little bit more detail to so your is that a and, yeah, what I would say is, what is the reference method for the UV, met, UV uh, uh, method they, they have been using in the lab? So if there's a reference method they're using, and if the reference method has a specific uh, coefficient variant of the results, for example, if the detection limit is low and the coefficient variant is, uh, in, if we are trying to find very lower amount of uh, adulteration, we need to consider what is the coefficient variant of the UV method that they are using. So, and what is the sensitivity of their UV detector? And if the instrument that they are using is also have a validation, validated uh, uh, validation protocol or already been validated for the precision or from the repeatability and reproducibility of the result. So when we are dealing with the inflation of the results we need to know what is the current sop what's the verify verification of that sop what is the current instrumentation instrument validation uh, and the repeatability and reproducibility of the method and uh, uh, i can talk a little bit more on this for example if we have if we wish to have reproducibility we need to uh, test that specific example that they mentioned in water or ethanol for 10 times and see what is the variation of the response from that and is the method or the detection uh, instrument is capable of accurately and or precisely detect the results. So there are lots of things we can talk but uh, probably it would be good if we can have a little bit more detailed discussion. Okay, thank you. The next question, what type of fraud can take place in fruit juices like mango, nectar, apple juice, orange juice? Okay, so that is the type of things that um, I probably, I, I, so there was, a, uh, there was a funny discussion that they were saying in order to uh, detect uh, the detectors in police when they want to think about a criminal, they need to think like a criminal. Well, I, I have, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the criminal mind <laughs> in mindset that to know what type of fraud they can do. Uh, but they generally are very creative people that are thinking about adding any fraud to food category. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have anything in my mind, but We'll generally step in when, when there is a report of a food fraud and then we start investigating that. Okay, thank you. We'll take uh, one more question here. And that is, 
uh, are there methods that can differentiate between a naturally derived chemical and a synthetic chemical like flavoring? In, uh, sorry, in what? In flavors? Uh, uh, is, well, is nat it, natural and synthetic. Uh, correct. Yep. Natural and synthetic chemicals like flavors. Y yes, they, they can. So generally when they are developing those type of uh, um, flavoring materials, they are, they are looking at the specific chemical structure of the food, uh, of the flavoring material, which generally are very specific chemicals and with a specific structural uh, con uh, con uh, definition. So depending on, depending on the type of uh, flavor, again, the type of uh, the, the amount of uh, precision and accuracy that they need to look at into it, they can use different type of uh, mixture of, I would say, mixture of a spectroscopic method and, uh, and, uh, and chromatographic methods to detect uh, possible fraud between the, between the synthetic or uh, non-synthetic material. If the, uh, so they are, uh, although they are, uh, they are very similar structures um, in the synthetic versus the natural ones. Uh, I'm not expert in, in flavoring uh, category because that's a little bit, uh, it's a very huge industry and they have their own uh, categorization. Uh, I would say probably they have their own way of finding uh, a specific structure compared to the natural component. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain what type of method they're using, but uh, probably would be interesting to have a little bit deep into that if uh, the person has interest. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you so much again for your time and thank you everyone in the audience for joining us. And, and uh, also thank you for some really good questions. And um, we have recorded this, so we will get it posted to the EAS website as soon as possible. Uh, if you have any additional questions, of course, you've gotten our DAS email, Alan Saylor, who is our Senior Director of Food Consulting Services, and then lots of great resources on the EAS website, which is also found at the bottom of the screen. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, Murdad, and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye.